faster than I thought. Give me a hand signal, Owen. Hello, I'm Carl from Lunchbox Sessions. Welcome to our third YouTube Live of the season. Our final live for this year, for this summer season, will be on September 28th on accumulators and intensifiers, so please mark your calendars. And great to have you with us here, everyone. We've got visitors or um, people signing in today from Pennsylvania, from Vietnam, apparently your Independence Day, Iraq, from Ontario here in Canada, from Sweden, Fort McLeod, Alberta, India, uh, from Finland, and from Elkford, BC. Welcome to all of you. Glad that you could make it. Hope you're doing well where you are. Hope your hydraulics work is going well. And uh, our continued gratitude for the knowledge sharing. Thank you to so many of you who write in to share your knowledge, individuals and companies. We really do appreciate that. Um, hydraulics is one of those fields where there's always something new to learn. So continuously humbling to work in this field and great that so many of us share uh, knowledge back and forth. That's terrific. Today we'll be looking at uh, electronics and electrical devices in hydraulic systems. And so that's a fun topic. I love the wires as much as I love the hoses. I hope you enjoy that too. There's a number of links on the YouTube Live page to a number of the components that we'll interact with today. So if some of the components are curious to you, if you'd like more information, look for those links to websites and PDF files that give you a little bit more background on some of the models of devices that you'll see here on the desktop that we'll be testing. And of course, our usual safety reminder that if your experience with hydraulics, and I guess we'll say electrical controls as well, if your experience is very limited, the amount of time we have today might not be enough to help you work with some of those uh, technologies safely. So please, um, if you're working for the first time with some of these, work with a mentor, someone who's a pro, and continue to pursue uh, hands-on training where you are. Feel free to log into your Google services or your YouTube account so that you can chat with us and ask questions and interact during the, uh, during the live. And yeah, we love finding out where you're from. Uh, welcome to additional guests from Tanzania in Africa and from Russia. If you're looking to uh, reach us to communicate with uh, thoughts, questions, topics outside of the scope, of today's topic, feel free to email us, info at lunchboxsessions.com, or look for me, Carl Dyke, industrial teacher on LinkedIn. I'm fairly easy to find there. Always willing to, to hear from you in that regard as well. Um, a shout out today to our partner for this series this summer, Fluid Power World, and Fluid Power World is your resource for components and for design and engineering knowledge. The Fluid Power Technology Conference continues with excellent virtual events. See the events tab on fluidpowerworld.com. Our major sponsor today is Delta Computer Systems. Delta Computer Systems RMC motion controllers are designed for high performance industrial hydraulic applications with the ability to tightly synchronize up to 50 axes of precise closed loop position, velocity and pressure force control and to smoothly transition between position and pressure force control. Delta's RMCs are well suited for demanding applications such as advanced pressing and forming machines, testing systems, wood processing equipment, and many more. The RMC's powerful control algorithms stem from Delta's decades of practical hydraulics and industrial experience, and the automated wizards in Delta's easy-to-use RMC tool software quickly guide users through setup, programming, and tuning. The powerful plotting provides real-time monitoring and display of control parameters, output, and feedback. And with the ability to connect to all common PLCs and sensors, 
Delta's RMCs are easy to apply in both new and retrofit applications. Delta's documentation training and free 24-7, 365 phone and email support get rave reviews. For more information, visit deltamotion.com. All right, welcome additional participants from, from India and Ukraine and Winnipeg, my original hometown. All right, our pop quiz question, which we'll answer at the very end of the live, and maybe this one's a bit of a techie one, but the question is, in a closed loop control system, a system that is monitored and self-adjusting, is error a bad thing? That word error, okay? Something to think about. All right, let's get underway with our technology and topics today. And <coughs> of course, keeping track of temperature in hydraulic fluid, making sure <coughs> that hydraulic fluid does not overheat is important to do. We've had a very hot summer and Heat was certainly an issue for many that we work with. So typically hydraulic temperature is often measured in, uh, in the tank as fluid is returned from the hydraulic system. And a very common device for getting that type of work done is a device called an RTD. <coughs> and well, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. This one is an RTD that is a PT100, okay, a category of, of RTD, resistance temperature detectors. And typically, this probe would be inside the fluid that you wish to, to measure, so right inside the tank. Sometimes it's in a well, and so a spring on the end helps keep it in contact with the end of that well, because there may be a bit of an air gap. Maybe you've seen RTDs in the industrial environment that look a little bit more like this. You've probably seen this type of angled uh, cap on the end here, uh, sealed with an O-ring and what have you for certain types of processing environments where the atmosphere may be challenging, connection to conduits and what have you. So that's a common configuration as well. Here is the RTD on the end of that assembly with tapered pipe thread in this case to uh, be inserted into a port on the tank. So that's a, a typical configuration. And of course, an RTD all by itself isn't designed to be directly connected to a, a PLC, let's say, that might be reading the exact value of the temperature. Typically, an RTD will need to be connected first to some type of a transmitter. So here we have some example transmitters. And if you're wondering why they're in the shape of a donut case like this, a little uh, donut ring, that shape is very popular for inserting into the head of this type of RTD enclosure assembly that I was showing there just a moment ago. So that sits right in there, that little hole in the center of the RTD slips even over that tube and the wiring can be connected in there. And that transmitter is required because the amount of current that's traveling through the RTD is very small and it needs to be translated and stepped up and then transmitted as a very standard industrial 4 to 20 milliamp signal. 4 to 20 milliamps is one of the very common industrial control signals and from there that signal is being taken in a series control loop. That's being connected, in this case, to the analog input card on a PLC that I have running here. I have control logics by Alan Bradley and an analog input card. And of course, an analog input card is ideal for reading an RTD temperature sis, uh, sensor because we want to know the exact temperature. We're not just working with a temperature switch in this case, but rather also a temperature sensor where we can get the exact value. So the RTD that I've got connected here and reading the ambient temperature here in the room is transmitting through the transmitter and then into, into the PLC. And let's just have a look here on uh, 
on my PLC's programming software. I'm just in program mode for those of you who know RS logics. Um, I'm not in run mode, I'm not running any particular logic, but I've opened my controller tags <coughs> and I've jumped down to my to my channel data for my uh, analog input card and here on channel, let me see if I can find it, yes, channel 6, there it is. There's the RTD reading temperature. I didn't do a calibration on it this morning, so that might be a little bit high, but that is reading the live temperature. If I was to hang on to this RTD for a while in my hand, which I'm doing now, we'll probably see the temperature start to climb a little bit. And of course, it's climbing in very small increments. Uh, analog sensors, of course, capable uh, and and an analog input card capable of reading very small changes in signal. Yesterday when I hung on to this long enough, the, uh, the, the reading was eventually over 35 C Celsius, which is a good indication. Um, yeah, so that's an example of a typical application for temperature sensed by an RTD. If I was to have a look at how we apply it to our reservoir, and perhaps you do something similar, our RTD on our test units and our learning pumps is threaded in through a, um, a threaded tapered port there, just below where oil is returning from our return to tank filter and a drop tube there. But then, of course, uh, you know, perhaps we, we don't want to send it to a PLC. Maybe we just want it to, to give us a readout of that fluid temperature on a control console somewhere. So some other applications that are that are simple and easy to work with that we like a lot is this device that you'll see here and that was the one on our panel this Wika SC64 is a handy one and in this case we don't need to buy one of those other transmitters that I was showing you that little donut ring transmitter in that case could also be bought in a DIN rail format that's common also but no in this case we don't actually need that because this is a purpose-built temperature reading instrument and it's already set up, as you'll see there on the left-hand side, where it says PT100. It's already set up on leads 5 and 6 to receive a signal from a standard industrial platinum 100 ohms at 0 degrees Celsius or 32F. That's what that means, PT100. And that is the type of sensor that we've got wired up there. And then you know, just giving us a readout of the temperature here in the room, which can read out in Celsius, or the program can be changed to give the temperature in Fahrenheit as well. And so that's a great application. It's just powered by, by 24 volts DC and easy to use. And it's not just a temperature readout. You could choose to use the relay contact as well and then use it as a controller to trigger cooling or heating. So that's a, a very typical type of application for RTDs in use to measure temperature. All right, let's have a look here. We've got some questions already. Let's have a look, and perhaps it's one we can answer. Yeah, OK. Um, Machines Channel was asking, hey, what's the difference between open and closed loop hydraulic systems? Well, sure, that's a great question. So yeah, an open loop. Hydraulic system, well, okay, so we won't spend so much time today talking about open loop versus closed loop hydraulic systems, which is about the path that the oil takes through the system and whether it returns to tank or back to pump. That's open and closed loop hydraulic systems, but today we're talking mostly, we're going to spend a bit of time talking about closed loop control systems, and so there's a bit of a difference there. If we look at a closed loop control system, that's where we're measuring some parameter out there in such as position, we're going to get to that one last, hydraulic cylinder position, and then measuring to see whether or not we arrived at the exact position we wanted to, and then use feedback to send a correcting signal. So we're going to work with that as, uh, as a type of control system. But I hope that helped answer your question. Uh, Machines Channel, um, Anchor Patel is um, saying, hey, thank you so much. I still remember. I just saw your video and animation before one day of exam, and I passed with a good grade. Hey, that's great to hear, Anchor. I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that our materials have, have helped you with that. Super. 
All right, so we've covered off on temperature. Let's have a look at another very popular electronic and electrical application in the world of hydraulics, and that is to measure the level of fluid in the tank. And so you'll often find that some type of instrument has been attached to a port at the very top of the hydraulic tank, and then perhaps there is a float that runs up and down with the level of the fluid to help. I mean, some cases it's just a temperature, or sorry, some cases it's just a level switch. But I like to have data serve to me more accurately. What if we are uh, oil charging accumulators, or what if we are discharging accumulators back into the hydraulic system? What if there's a leak somewhere out on the plant floor and we can detect that by noticing that the level is dropping? And again, this is a type of instrument that could send the signal into a PLC. In this case, again, we chose a two-wire. Uh, we could have chosen a voltage, uh, a 0 to 10 volt voltage signal output to drive to our PLC, let's say. That's common but so is 4 to 20 milliamps in the industrial environment, perhaps even more common. So this two-wire 4 to 20 milliamps control signal is used in a series control loop. Not a lot of time to cover that entire concept during our live, but if you know or look up what a 4 to 20 milliamp instrumentation uh, control loop looks like, then you'll see it's based on just two wires. And this is uh, from GEMS, it's a XT800, we like this one. It's a series of reed switches inside the hollow tube with re each reed switch with a resistor forming a large uh, voltage divider on the inside. And in this case, we've got it hooked up to true meter. Uh, GEMS has their own barcode displays as well, but we like to use the, the true meters on our, on our display panel. And what you'll see, of course, as I'm moving this up and down you know, on the display there, what you'll notice is that the resolution is at about one quarter of an inch. Every time this float moves a quarter of an inch, we're getting a new reading, five, six millimeters, and that's very accurate. So in this case, we just created a, a, a scale. We just said maybe there's maximum capacity for 1,200 liters or 1,200 gallons in the tank. And so there's my float up at the very top of the, uh, uh, of the range in the tank. I've got it right up at the top there, as high as it would go, and maybe that would be an overfill condition, something that we might find a little bit alarming. So we've programmed it to say over, and then perhaps once we drop down below 1100, maybe we're now in the normal level range, and on down we go. And so as we head on down, maybe we get below, what, what did Alex program it for? Let's see, he programmed it so that below 600, we want to alert ourselves that maybe we're at a, at a frighteningly low level. So that's a float, and that float in there has a small magnet in it. It's a very lightweight um, a float, but there's a small magnet on the inside of that float, and that's what's triggering those reed switches inside that tube at about a one-quarter inch resolution, and that is actually quite good. Um, reed switches aren't the only technology out there for sensing tank levels. Sometimes it's magnetostriction, like the kind we're going to see on position sensors. Uh, sometimes it's even ultrasonic or even radar based. But this is a simple application to get a good range of analog signals and the read switch assembly gets it done. As you can see, we deploy that ourselves on the top of our tank. If I jump in here for a moment, you'll see it there. There's the, the entry at the top of the tank. And then if we look down inside, move some hoses out of the way, you can kind of see the float there on the level. And that's accounting for what you see here on our tank. We're going by percentage. We like that. So we've programmed our display to say lev percent. And we're at 96% of our tank fill, which is a good thing. Yeah, so that's an example of an application for, for level control. Hope that gives you some ideas. Let's have a look at TrueMeter. So TrueMeter is the device that 
that you saw there flashing green, flashing red, and I was moving that float mechanism up and down. So there it is again, and you're thinking, hey, how do you set up that type of a display? And so I'm plugged in on the back here through a USB port. That doesn't have to stay permanently connected. That's just during programming. Oh, I guess while we're looking back here, we can see that there's an input if you're sending in in current, I input, so that's good for current, 4 to 20 milliamps. If my sensor, if my float sensor had been 0 to 10 volts analog, I would have used those other two connections. So this is just that process meter, APM-PROC, my true meter. We like that one. It's good to use. Things electronic, right? And so here's the application for programming it over a USB port. Very simple Windows app. And you can see here is where some parameters were set up. 0 to 1,200. We said that was just our maybe our fictitious fill volume for, for the tank. Maybe we could have put in there 0 to 100 and worked off of percentage. Display peak is turned on. That's a little, that's a little bar that you see that just shows up briefly at the top of the range before we back down. And then it disappears, that little extra little bar that you see on the arc there. Yeah, all kinds of little features with these. And of course, there's our quick setup to indicate what type of electrical signal we were receiving. Was it 0 to 10 volts? That was V input. So it is if your signal in is minus to plus 10 uh, volts DC analog. Or there's our, our current options for current and messages that are being displayed and the programming of alarms and the colors of the screen and, and the backlighting and what have you. And that's all very simple to do and save very quickly from a little USB utility, a little uh, programming utility through USB cable to that process meter. So that's a great way to, to work, with, um, work with a level control application. All right. And um, yeah, so questions coming in. Let's have a look. David Steger, yeah, he's saying, will you be reviewing proportional pulse with modulation solenoid controls as it relates to pilot hydraulic functioning? Um, we did one on that last summer, David, uh, PWM control, I believe, but I probably will make reference to it because we're going to open a Parker uh, application for a... Uh, uh, an amplifier in a little bit here, so stick with us. And we will indeed make reference to variable current drive for, for solenoids on a valve that you see there. And so, yeah, we'll touch upon that briefly, perhaps not as deep as you might wish, but uh, we could certainly come back to that topic again as well. You bet. It's a very popular one. And ultimately, of course, driving a lot of solenoids in, uh, in proportional valving is about PWM. So, yeah, great, uh, great observation and question there. Uh, Prince uh, Rajpura says, what is the control in an A4 VG71 pump model? Yeah, unfortunately, we won't have time uh, to address that one today. But, um, you know, feel f look, look on the, on the Rexroth, Bosch Rexroth website for that model number. And there's quite a bit of documentation available to you there. Unfortunately, we won't have time to address that specific one in our electronics uh, in hydraulics class today. Aditya says, hello Carl, is using PLC or DAQ, that's usually data acquisition system, like NI is better for hydraulic system control and measurement. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I have a, a, a specific an opinion about that. I think you're referring to national instruments, perhaps, uh, LabVIEW. Um, yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time working with it directly myself, so not sure I'm, I have an expert response for you on that. Hey, welcome additional participants since I last look from Norway and also from Mexico. All right, from two, uh, two spots far and away on planet Earth. Glad to have you with us. All right, hey, while we were talking about that true meter, let's uh, segue over to looking at, uh, at turbine flow meters. Um, quite often, hydraulic flow is about 
getting an accurate reading of hydraulic flow, perhaps in terms of liters per minute or gallons per minute. And a turbine flow meter is the device that lets you have data about that electronically. And so this is one example of a turbine flow meter. This CT15 is all set up to uh, be either a 0 to 15 or a 1 to 15 liter per minute, or in this case calibrated to be a quarter of a gallon to four gallon per minute flow this particular size. And of course there's an, an impeller spinning in the middle of the hydraulic flow stream in the middle, and then a magnetic pickup sensor is catching the passing by of every blade on the impeller. There's a number of blades on that turbine impeller, and that gives very high resolution for the changes in flow rate. And then, of course, some uh, conversion or transmitter electronics inside that take those pulses and end up giving you an M12 connector where you can ship that out, again, as either variable analog voltage or as analog uh, current. In our case, as you can see on the tag, we selected 4 to 20 milliamps, very standard industrial control signal. And so that's the device that is providing us with a constant flow rate measurement that you see here. You know, if we're looking at pump outlet flow and we want to have lots of decimal values, and of course we could just as easily send that 4 to 20 milliamp signal into our PLC and find out that we have the ability to read that flow in the PLC in case we're using the PLC to control other parameters for the machinery in the plant or set some alarms, whatever that might be. M watching and monitoring flow rate electronically often involves, in hydraulics, often involves the use of a turbine style flow meter. So there's a number of different models and you know quite often we just use it together again with with true meter. In fact sometimes you can buy those two pieces uh, together as a kit and you're all set to go and measure flow very accurately. All right, so questions from um, from Machines Channel. What is the equipment that protects the engine? Okay, mobile equipment now probably from damages due to pump overloading. Right, okay, so that's an interesting one for sure. Quite often if there's an issue where overloading a hydraulic pump might cause pressures and, and um, a horsepower loading on the prime mover, a diesel engine so great that there is the possibility <coughs> of stall damage to a diesel engine, then quite often that's a part of a scheme called horsepower limiting or torque limiting, which is sometimes manual linkage inside of a torque limiting pump. But since we're talking about electronics today, then the electronic version of that is usually about a tone wheel on the drive shaft of the engine that is being monitored by a mag pickup or a Hall effect sensor. And so then quite often the electronic control gear, the processor, the ECM, um, which is a mobile world version of PLC, right? Uh, typically that is reading the RPMs. And so perhaps it is programmed to look at at a maximum RPM droop from that diesel engine of, you know, if it droops more than 50 RPMs or it droops down more than 100 RPMs, then stroke back, limit the amount of flow that the pump can put out. That's a very typical scheme. And by limiting the flow that the pump can put out, which is then quite often a pilot, a proportional pilot controlling solenoid, on the pump, uh, very typical on excavators, right? That's a, a really common application for that. Then the, uh, the controller just limits the maximum flow rate from that pump and pulls the engine back up into its normal operating RPM so that that engine is not being in danger of overloading and potentially stalling. Yeah, that's a great example actually of closed loop control using electronic sensors to monitor, even though the engine is not hydraulic, if the engine is driving the uh, hydraulic pumps, it can be used as part of a uh, closed loop control scheme. Really great question there. Uh, Sundara Pali asking, sir, why, are, why sensors are malfunction voltage or amps are sufficient? I'm not quite sure um, what you're asking there, but um, 
uh, you know, if you could try again and let us know specifically what you're after in terms of voltage or amperage, malfunctions, not quite sure what, what you're after there. Sorry about that. All right, um, pressure, hydraulic pressure. Probably everybody's been waiting to think about that one. Uh, pressure transmitters come in, um, you, well, usually they're all in little cylindrically, cylindrical shaped devices that uh, just thread directly. Here you can see a manifold with four different uh, pressure uh, transmitters. These are not pressure switches, right? Pressure switches you adjust with a screwdriver to some pressure value and then click. No, in this case, these pressure transmitters are continuous reading and they're meant to keep track of the range. There's different types of, of connectors and what have you, but in all cases, it's about an analog signal very common for us to use this particular one that I put on the spec sheets and it sends out 4 to 20 milliamps uh, for the range of pressure that is 0 to 2,000 psi. That's a ProSense pressure transmitter. There's other ones here. This one by no shock is sending out 0 to 10 volts DC across the range of pressures that it receives. So generally very simple devices to integrate often making use of technology called thin film, which is a form of, um, of strain gauge. As the materials inside are compressed, they deflect just very slightly and the resistance changes and that is read and converted by the electronics inside the sensor to be either that 4 to 20 or that 0 to 10. Thin film is not the only technology, sometimes capacitive or sometimes piezoelectric is also very popular. We integrate a pressure sensor right on the outlet of the pump, well, just after the, the turbine flow meter, right? We come out of the pump, we like to measure flow rate, and then the next thing you know, we're keeping track of pressure right close to the source at the outlet of the pump. It's not being reported on the panel here. We like to use an analog gauge, but we have our breakout box from our power unit, and then we can connect it into the PLC and monitor and work with the pressure, analog pressure range in that way. All right, so that takes us to our next topic, which is MDTs, magnetostrictive um, displacement transducers. And these are interesting devices. If you work in any type of environment where very precise monitoring of the cylinder's position and sending it to that position very precisely. A device like this one is popular. It is threaded right in from the back of the cylinder. We've got some others around here actually where the electronics head goes right inside the cylinder and you see nothing on the outside. Very popular on mobile machinery if such a device is going to be used is to not have electronics hanging out the back of the cylinder. Too, uh, too much in danger of being smashed and damaged. So then electronics can actually be originally enclosed right into the cylinder. And of course that's from the back end, the base end of the cylinder. So the rod itself inside the cylinder has to be gun drilled hollow to receive the, uh, the probe loosely with a clearance fitting around it. And then typically a magnet is mounted, screwed to the back of the piston. So if you imagine the cylinder extending and retracting, this magnet is on the back end of the piston, and that's what makes up the technology that we're calling magnetostrictive, very popular. Let's just have a look here at a, at a signal. As I move the magnet further out, in this case we're using a pulse width modulation output type of signal, so the duty cycle increases. There we are at 75%. And as I slide the magnet back toward the electronic head, then we find out that our duty cycle is shrinking back down. Now we're at 20%. And so the electronics that are going to monitor this device, a PLC perhaps, or some other type of controller, a Delta RMC controller, will be monitoring that pulse width and that will be the, the method by deciding that the, uh, the cylinder is in the correct position or still has farther to travel. You can learn more about that. We have a good lesson on lunchbox sessions 
that allows you to get a better feel for how the magnetostrictive technology works. The electronic head sends a, a current pulse down the waveguide, which is a, a ferromagnetic wire, magnetic capable wire, and as that pulse travels down, there's a radial magnetic field that you see there, and it eventually collides and intersects with the magnetic field that's running in an in a alternate axis around that magnet that's traveling with the piston. And then, of course, what ends up happening is the ferromagnetic wire is tugged or distorted slightly, and that wire is then going to give a short tug to a device called a strain gauge that is back inside the electronics head and there's a little strip of metal in there, a little armature that gets a quick little tug as that, as that pulse that travels back at the speed of sound, that little tug, uh, yanks on that little armature and at that moment the voltage that was being used as the exciter voltage through the, uh, through the winding for the strain gauge, that voltage changes, and at that moment, that change is detected, and the timing of sending out the interrogation pulse on the waveguide and the return of that pulse uh, ultra, uh, you know, sonically on the waveguide to pull on that little armature, that time is what is referenced against the time clock running inside the electronics head to allow us to know where the cylinder is currently uh, out there in its stroke, extension, retraction, what have you. So there it is again on the scope meter. I'm sliding the magnet down along the MDT towards the tip and then, oops, almost too far, almost went off the end, that's not good. And then back towards the electronics head and that's allowing us to resolve to a very fine degree and know exactly where the cylinder is at any time. Here you can see some applications for it on a hydraulic cylinder in our collection. So there's an MDD, MDT sensing the position of a six inch cylinder that pushes against the spring. You see another one down here on the bottom of a cylinder. But right beside it is this aluminum tube. This is a little bit older series, but uh, they still make it this way too. And this is a, a dry or externally mounted MDT in case there isn't room to package inside your, uh, your cylinder or if there's an application other than a hydraulic cylinder. This is the same type of magnetostrictive technology just meant to live in the outside world. Same thing happening here in a few examples on on a one foot on a 12 inch cylinder that is mounted rod down trying to control the the movements of a 100 pound steel weight so yeah that's all applies to the world of of servo motion all right let's just see if there's some additional questions we should answer Yes, okay, so hopefully, Prasanna, hopefully I just answered your question there. There are indeed lots of cylinder position sensors mounted from the outside, and in fact, we'll see another one hard at work here in a minute. Just let me swing my camera back around. So have a look at this particular sensor. It says here that it's a rotary encoder. Well, but it's actually a linear sensor. What you'll see here, it's a little hard to see, but there is a cable pulled um, device mechanism here that is automatically retracted by the head of the encoder and we've got it connected by a magnet to, to a, a steel block that's going to move here. The one inch cylinders that are below here, they don't really, not really sized well to take a internal. So this was a different application for an external and that is a cable pulled positioning transducer. Very fine cable being pulled and then spring retracted. And again, we're taking four to 20 signal into our control system and we're going to be using that one in, in a moment to see some very interesting motion control problems. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's see. S uh, voltage and amps are at spec... Here's another question from Sundara Pali. Voltage and amps are specified or at specified values but sensors are malfunction. Oh, okay, okay. I think this is tied to the same question as before perhaps. Let me think about that for a moment. 
What is the main reason for the malfunction of sensors? Well, Sandra Pali, I'm not sure how to advise you specifically on your circumstance, but definitely try to find the specification sheets for the particular model of sensor that you're using there. I'm not sure what difficulties you're having. Could be anything from connections to internal failures of the electronics, or perhaps it wasn't applied correctly in the control scheme, but if you can contact the manufacturer of that sensor, hopefully they'll be able to give you a hand with that. All right, let's see. We looked at a little bit of magnetostrictive, so let's see where things go next. Amplifiers, yeah, okay. So um, David mentioned earlier about pulse width modulation and amplifiers, and right, you know, um, the PLC, if we were going to drive hydraulic valves from a programmable logic controller or perhaps from an ECM in, in a mobile application, you know, the type of signals that, that are sent out as an analog output are often not meant to actually drive amperage to hydraulic valve solenoids. You know, hydraulic valve solenoids might need, oh, some of them need up to 2, 2.2, 2.5 amps. A lot of mobile valves uh, that are proportional maybe top out at 900 milliamps, but that's still almost an amp. That's far too much current for, an for many electronic controllers to send out directly, and so that's when we need some type of amplifier to take that fine 0 to 10 volt signal that comes out of an electronic controller or that 4 to 20 milliamp signal and turn it into uh, the type of drive current that um, that makes sense to actually energize the solenoid and, and move the armature for a directional valve. So in this particular case here, with this proportional valve, the solenoid is here, but this is the, the amplifier electronics. It's on board. And so all we need to do is send, well this one needs to have a 0 to 20 milliamp signal sent to it, but that's not enough current to actually move our valve. So that's the job of this amplifier, and in this case, it's on board, right? If we were to look at a, a, a proportional, this is a proportional pressure reducing valve, this particular sun valve, and so in this case, it still needs an amplifier. Well, the amplifier is here. It's built in, very small electronics. You know, the connector for hooking up to it, the DIN or Hirschman style connector is almost larger than the amplifier itself. And then you may see this little, uh, jog box that Alex found for me to be able to just quickly send in a uh, voltage signal or current signal depending on what the configuration is. This particular valve is configured to wait for voltage uh, signals to arrive and so we can dial them up and but you'd say oh that's not enough how could a little battery powered box do that? Well it can't. This is just the drive signal like we would emulate Normally, we'd work with a PLC driving this valve, but no, we still need to have 24 volts. I don't have it hooked up right now, but I'd need a 24-volt power supply to actually supply that amplifier with the kind of a voltage or potential that it needs to drive the solenoid and move the spool inside the valve. So, yeah, the amplifier electronics are on a very compact circuit board on the valve. Uh, here is a Eurocard style amplifier. So now the amplifier is not on the valve. It's maybe in a cabinet somewhere. And that's a Eurocard style amplifier. We're going to come back to this one in a moment because of P, I, and D, which is a, an interesting topic for us to visit briefly on this type of an amplifier. And perhaps if we were to look at just one more example, we would notice that some of these amplifiers that are not meant to be on the valve, that are meant to be in a control cabinet, might be DIN rail mounted, like this particular one here. This one is PWDXX. Parker makes a number of different models of these boxes, control amplifiers, depending on what your valve application is, whether it's a single solenoid pressure or flow valve, or whether it's a directional valve. And this particular one with the D in the model code means that it's meant to be used with a directional valve that not only has two solenoids, but also has an LVDT. That's a type of position sensor that is tracking the actual position of the spool. That's a form of closed loop control at this point, but not closed loop control of the cylinder, closed loop control of the main valve spool. 
in this two-stage valve. Solenoid controlled proportionally, pilot operating the main flow spool, and so a DIN rail mounted amplifier can get that done. In this case, we don't have to leave the computer serial connection permanently hooked up. We've got a green light on, that's good. But no, you just need to have that hooked up while we're programming. So let's have a look at the application for that. And other companies make some similar types of amplifiers, but the one from Parker is like such that you use a little application software called Pro PXD. I'll just minimize the other one. And you have all of these parameters that can be set. And you might say, uh oh, current channel A4, that's very heavy amperage. No, it's not 4 amps, that's, that's current range 4, which tells us down here that current range number 4 is equivalent to 1.3 amps. So that's for a valve that needs to go up to 1300 milliamps, I guess we could say. Uh, perhaps we've selected our valve here from the chart and these parameters are automatic, but of course, doesn't have to be a Parker valve. This is just a good DIN rail amplifier for driving any valve with an LVDT. If you know the electronic parameters, you could simply type them in here. And if those specifications have been provided for the dither frequency, 60 hertz in this case, what have you, then those types of things could be typed in. And when you're ready, send all. We click a little button there, send all to the PWDXX. The programming is done and nothing to adjust with a tuning screwdriver. It's all set to go. So that's just a range of typical amplifiers. But oh, going back to David's question though from earlier about variable drive to proportional valves. Any time that we're sending a variable current as we can with these uh, proportional controllers, and so maybe it would be maximum 1.3. No, actually here the maximum channel was set to, for the A channel was set to 85% of that upper 1.3 amps. And so yes, in the end that would turn out to be a controlled current by virtue of pulse width modulation. You saw that on the, on the fluke scope meter just briefly, that type of signal, when I was showing the, um, the MDT, the magnetodestrictive displacement transducer earlier. So yeah, pulse width modulation, very popular way to, to tackle variable current for drive purposes as well. Yeah, uh, Arnab is asking, sir, what's the difference between a PLC and an ECM? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Um, you know, a programmable logic controller quite often lives in a control cabinet more in a plant environment, although I do see them on mobile equipment, very complex mobile equipment, ba mobile batch plants would be an example, or on a mining shovel, sometimes still a PLC but on many pieces of mobile equipment for construction and what have you, then we switch over to something that might just be referred to as an ECM, electronic control module, which in many cases has all of the electronics in it that are similar to a PLC, but in a highly ruggedized case, usually very compact, and often the outside user has very limited ability to interact with the internal programming and make changes because the manufacturer may be very concerned about keeping private, for safety reasons, uh, the programming they may have put in there for the brake system, steering and what have you. But electronically speaking, there is indeed a lot of crossover and similarity between various electronic control modules and PLCs as they are applied to hydraulic systems, yeah. All right, we had um, other folks join us from Norfolk, England. Welcome to you during our live, great. All right, so we looked at some, uh, some amplifiers. Well, let's go into a little bit of closed loop control here and find out what it means to do closed loop control for motion. You can also do closed loop control for the amount of squeeze pressure, which is that force application that might be needed in some process in manufacturing or what have you. But probably the one that most people relate to best is motion control for a hydraulic cylinder. So let's have a look at that. Um, maybe I'll just grab my mobile camera again here and we'll head over to that, that Eurocard mounted valve I was telling you about earlier. And so what we're going to do is use this directional valve to extend 
and retract a cylinder here with a mass that's mounted to the top of it. This particular control card that we have here requires that there be a position instrument on the hydraulic cylinder. This one isn't really meant to work unless we're in a closed loop environment. You can even see the word loop. It's there. When we put this valve into action, as we have by moving it to the right, it's expecting closed loop motion control. So it could have been one of those magnetostrictive sensors. But no, as you know, I spoke about it earlier, it's this cable pulled encoder. You can just barely see that cable, but it's there. And that is attached to our cylinder motion, and that's going to provide feedback. So that cable encoder, that displacement transducer that is cable pulled, is connected to our amplifier card. In this case, uh, we're using connection D6 because it's current. Uh, that we're sending in, and that creates a complete closed loop system. Now you'll see these three factors for tuning. Tuning a closed loop is where we get into deciding how we are going to respond to issues where the set point, which is what we, you know, the position we desire the cylinder to be at, versus what is often spoke of in control technology, closed loop control technology, as the process variable, meaning where is the cylinder right now. So we're just going to simplify those two terms and say desired position versus actual position at the hydraulic cylinder. And when there's a difference between those two, then the cylinder uh, then the system, the control system, needs to react to that. That difference between the position I want versus the position I've got at any one moment, when we change, we say, hey, cylinder, go to your extended position at 10 inches. If it's not there yet, in that moment, we open up something called error. That's that, that's that term I spoke at about at the beginning. And error just simply means there's now a difference between the position we want and the position we got. Think about your cruise control, right? If you have your cruise control on the highway set for the speed of 80, but all of a sudden you're, you're doing 60 for some reason, going up a hill, now you've got an error. You wanted to go 80, the speed you wanted, but the speed you've got is 60. Well, if the closed loop control system knows how to respond, it will step on the throttle in your automobile and try to return you to that speed of 80. Well, that is three different types of calculations or error corrections that are often done called proportional, integral, and derivative. And there's a lot of study that one, a lot of study that one could do on that beyond the scope of what we'll cover today. But we'll just briefly look at proportional response, which is a type of error correction signal that says, hey, an error has opened up a difference has opened up between where we want the cylinder to be and where it is now. And then we can set a proportional gain to send out a correcting signal to the drive, to drive the valve solenoid by increasing its current. Yeah, that's pulse width modulation again there, David. What do you know? We've been on that topic here all day. We're going to increase the current to the valve, which will then send a higher pilot pressure to move our valve spool, and that will move our cylinder. And when our cylinder arrives in place, remember, we've got a feedback instrument on the cylinder, then it will ramp down the current, close up the valve, and say, hey, we've arrived. And if that green light comes on, that green light, if we see that come on, that's going to mean we reached the correct position, that we're in position. Now, what you're going to find that's really funny about this system that I'm showing you is that I've, I've got a valve here that's rated for 50 gallons per minute. This very large valve spool in here, 50 gallon per minute, 200 liter per minute valve. And we're working with a small cylinder, and we're only working with about one gallon per minute about four liters per minute in this uh, hydraulic system. So this is really an oversized valve uh, for the job. And so watch and see what happens as we call for some positions here. I'll fire up the hydraulics. We'll get going. I'll stand over on the other side here. So I'm going to instruct, I'm going to instruct the cylinder to, to drop down a ways. I'm only going to pick one position. But let's watch and see what the cylinder does. Let's see if it can just arrive accurately at position. Uh-oh, what happened there? 
I asked it to go to one position, and it overshot on the way down. Remember, our valve spool is very, very large, and so when the cylinder arrived in position, gathering feedback from that cable pulled sensor, by then it was telling the valve to close up, but the valve was so large it took time to close up, there was still flow coming, so it it, uh, we'll say it undershot the position, and the, PI, the, the control system with proportional gain had to correct and shoot back the other way, and it overshot. This time, we'll, we'll come up a distance. I'll turn my dial to a position we will come up about 10 inches. And let's see if it can stop. Oh, my goodness. Having some trouble. What you'll notice is that every time, the cylinder is overshooting. Okay, We'll go back down again and watch and see that again. The cylinder has a tough time arriving accurately and stopping in position. And by the way, this is a good time for us to talk about something in control theory called disturbance. So I'm just going to put my screwdriver behind the wire to keep myself safe here. And I'll pull, I'll pull outward on the cable. And when I pull outward on the cable, well, that tricks the control system into thinking that maybe something pulled the cylinder rod out. Right? And so what you'll see is that the control hydraulics is pulling down on the cylinder, thinking that it drifted outward past where it was supposed to be. Right? When I let go, it shortens up, and it figures the cylinder came back in, so, this, so the control system extended. So that's just letting us know how live the response is to the feedback coming from that cable-pulled displacement transducer that's watching the position of our hydraulic system. So that's part of what makes it a closed loop. So back over to the, to the valve now and, and the controller, what we find out is that with such a large spool, maybe with the metering, if, if you're familiar with the V notches that are cut into a proportional spool, maybe we should only have moved that spool a tiny amount just to barely crack it open so that it wouldn't take so long to travel that valve closed again when we get close to the position we want. So perhaps what I need to do then in this case is insert a tuning screwdriver. Hopefully I got on the slot there. There we go. And I'm just going to do some very very quick and rough and ready tuning. And I'm going to turn the proportional gain value down quite far. So by the way, our green light is on. So we were able to achieve position because with our cylinder passing that mass through our set point, th there was times when it matched up and it just canceled the valve and it, it did arrive in position. And I'm going to keep turning down our, our proportional gain here quite far. And at times, we might even find out that that green lamp goes out here. But let's see what happens as we instruct our cylinder to move. So here I am now asking the cylinder to extend. Let's see what happens here. Oh, I'm going to make it retract. Sorry, there we go. So retracted, but and it came down, and it seemed to have a very soft landing. But what you'll notice is that the in-position light isn't on. And if we were actually watching the data coming back from the sensor, we would find out that the cylinder is, in fact, still moving. With just proportional gain only and with a very small amount of it, what we find out is that this cylinder is never going to make it to position because the difference between the, po the position we want and the position we've got is constantly changing and the control card is constantly making a new version of proportional response. So it's never quite going to match, and we'll probably never arrive. But at least we've gotten rid of this terrible overshoot. But now we're having trouble even arriving in the exact position we want. We're going to extend back up a ways and see what happens. Let's extend up a ways more. Yeah, definitely not overshooting and coming back. But you can certainly see that the cylinder is still moving it's having a hard time reaching the actual desired position. And that means that we probably need some additional tuning and perhaps also the introduction of integral gain, which we won't have time to discuss all of those, but it basically has to do with how long does the error continue to persist. And maybe in some very slow motion control systems, maybe derivative might be used, not as common, but proportional and integral. 
and we'd need to do a lot of tuning and is there a way to plug in a voltmeter and measure those gain factors and do some math and do some manual PID tuning? Yes, indeed there is. But it's pretty complicated stuff and time consuming and perhaps even dangerous in the plant environment to get things figured out that way. So what other options are open to us? Well, that's where we break into the world of the electronic motion controller. And so let's have a look at an electronic motion controller in this case. We're going to work with an RMC 150 motion controller, servo motion controller. That's this device here in black with its cards. We've got uh, two different axes currently wired up. We'll just work with one. We'll work with our axis number one. This is the MDT uh, Temposonics transducer coming back from the cylinder that had the spring that I showed you earlier. We're we're using the lower drive wire there to drive our valve. And then the rest of it is about electronics programming that we can do inside the software. Now let's have a look at the software for that. So right now, perhaps, I'll just make a, a little program cycle here. So here is a program with some, some very basic movements that I'll just activate. Let's see if that's going to run. That's looking good. And so, very simple, just three positions. I'm doing a full extend, then a halfway retract, and then jump back to the beginning and retract the cylinder all the way. And it's just going to continue to cycle these three motions that you see there on screen at the moment. And let's have a look and and see what the reality is. So there's that extend, and there's our retract halfway back, and then our full retract, and then we'll start again. So this is just a, a very simple sequence with just, with just three motion positions. But, um, oh yeah, but look at, look at the dynamics of this, is that halfway through the cylinder's extension, we bump into a spring for the second half of the extension. Let's watch that again. As the cylinder extends, the end of that cylinder rod with the little puck that's on the end, the little disc on the end, eventually hits that spring. And then when you start to retract, you've got the spring actually giving a boost, pushing hard on the rod saying, hey, hydraulic cylinder, I'd like to push you into retraction there. So there's some dynamics to the way this cylinder is being uh, uh, controlled or the field influences, let's say, the disturbance from the processor, the machinery, let's call that. And when I started to tune this the other day and had some motions to retract, when I asked for it to retract from the six inch position, the cylinder shook and there were some very uneven motions because of the additional push of that spring and I had not yet done the PID tuning. So it was hard for me to stop partway through that spring. There were some very jumped and uncomfortable motions. And so I needed to do that type of PID tuning that you saw me doing with a screwdriver a moment ago. But in this case, in this case, we carried that out in software. So as an example, if I go back to my configuration here, let me just stop that program momentarily. I'll just put that program into a stop so that it doesn't run. It'll complete one more cycle. Oh, maybe I didn't stop it. There we go. We've got our program stopped. And if I go up to Axis Tools, and I go over to my Axis 1, and I have a look at what's possible there for tuning. If I go back to my setup for a moment, you'll see that I had a start-stop uh, type of, of transducer on there. That was configured earlier. But then when I switch to tuning and I launch a wizard for tuning, it's saying, hey, would you like to use the auto-tuning wizard? And I say yes to that. 
And then there's a warning, of course, that I need to agree that I understand the risks that my machinery and the plant could move, make sure that there's nobody in the way that could be safety, make sure that the machinery isn't going to smash into other aspects of the machinery, make sure that the axis is clear to move, and then a typical tuning might involve two moves, which is very handy in this case, because if you think about our cylinder, our first tuning move will start at when the cylinder is just extended, not even three quarters of an inch extended outward, and then there'll be a positive move towards extension as the cylinder drops. But then that really important one on our six inch cylinder from a position fairly near the end of stroke, we're going to do a tuning with a negative move, meaning towards retraction. And that's when that, that's when that spring will be pushing and that's a very dynamic environment where we're getting some, some external disturbance from the machinery itself, that external spring. And so that'll be a very important part of the tuning to make sure that we don't have any jerky motions when we're done. Oops, I didn't put my controller in program mode, but that's been handled automatically now so that I'm out of run mode. And here comes my first uh, test where I move my cylinder into position that 0.68 inches and then here comes the first auto-tune move and you'll see the plotting in the background changing or measuring the motion as we do that there's our captured plot of that motion we'll look at that in just a moment so that was that first move and then we'll hit next and we'll say move to the start position let's just have a look and see this next position when I click move to start, should go out to fairly close to the extended point, that 5.3 inches, and then we'll say move negative, and there'll just be a tiny little move there on the cylinder, so that's not as interesting as what is going to happen here in software. So let's just watch in software and watch the plot occur as well. So we'll say move negative, and a plot has been captured. Okay, and so there's the plot that involves uh, a number of different factors in the colors that you see here. If I was, well, we'll come to that at the end, I guess, when I've, I've accepted the settings. We'll have a look at the plot a little bit more. So we've done the plotting, and then here is the model that has been calculated for a first order um, control model. And I could say finish. And that brings up the gain calculator. Gains have already been calculated for proportional and integral so that I don't have to spend a lot of time doing calculations or perhaps measuring uh, gain voltages on that amplifier card. They've been calculated for me. If I think I know better <laughs> or could tune them some more, I could make changes. But for the most part, hitting apply, apply gains is good and then closing out of that, and now we've been tuned for smooth motion. Now if we go back and look at this plot that we've got here, the plotting tool is very powerful, because if we turn back on the target position in, in that light blue turquoise color, we'll see that the actual position was tracking right over top of that, so very accurate. And then we could turn off the velocity uh, tracks as well and find out that the target velocity and the axis uh, one actual velocity were a perfect match. So th motion control is happening very accurately in this particular case. And so now I'm done with guessing as to how to get smooth motion on this cylinder, even in the face of the uh, external challenge and the dynamics of that spring that like to push it back into retraction. And so tuning has been done very quick and easily. So those are some examples of electronic controls. There we go. Okay, and a question from Machines Channel. What is an RC controller in a mining shovel? I'm not sure, RC, I mean, I guess if you mean uh, a type of controller that gets used in a mining shovel for the hydraulics, I've bumped into everything from Siemens ABB to uh, Rockwell's PLC-5 to other uh, proprietary controllers that Hitachi puts inside their shovels 
what have you. So there's a pretty wide variety of electronic controllers that get used in mining shovels. I hope that helps answer your questions, Machines Channel. Thank you for that. All right, so um, that's pretty much it for our coverage of electronics today. Uh, we'll have the answer to the pop quiz question though coming up in just a moment. There's many more learning materials available to you on electronic topics, on lunchbox sessions. We spoke first about resistance temperature de detectors, RTDs. You'll find out lots of useful information on how those work and how the signals are read and processed. Also pressure sensors, we talked about a pressure sensor with thin film or a strain gauge type of technology. That's available to you to learn as well. In lunchbox sessions, feel free to look at your possibilities there on lunchboxsessions.com. Always new lessons coming every month as well. Our team here at, at CD Industrial Group and lunchboxsessions.com, the services, systems and products, are Nathan, Crystal, Robin, Chris, Ivan, Alex, Keelan, Emily, Mark, Lenore, Owen, and Tad. And of course, I'm Carl, thanking all of you for being our participants today and thanking our key sponsor, Delta Computer Systems also. And if you're looking for the answer to our pop question as to whether or not error is good or bad, well, the answer is neither. Error is just the difference between where we wanted that cylinder to be and where it was in the moment when we changed the command. And so it's neither good nor bad as long as your controller has an effective way to deal with it and close the gap in a way that gives you the, the closed loop control response that you're after. All right, thanks for being with us today. See you on September 28th for our last YouTube Live of the season. Wishing you well with your hydraulics work. See you next time.